Five years ago, I found myself deep within the Salmon Huckleberry Wilderness, 18 air miles east of Estacada, Oregon. It was a place of raw beauty. It was a moonlit night. My hiking companions and I had set up camp near a pristine lake, eager to spend the night under the starry sky. The atmosphere was filled with laughter and excitement as we exchanged stories around the crackling campfire. However, as the night grew darker, an eerie silence fell upon the forest. Suddenly, piercing screams tore through the stillness, jolting us from our conversations. The chilling sound seemed to originate from the heart of the wilderness, carrying an otherworldly quality that sent shivers down our spines. Fear gripped us as we scrambled to pack our belongings. Panic spread like wildfire, and one man, overcome by terror, lost control and wet his pants. We were desperate to escape the clutches of whatever creature or force was responsible for those blood-curdling screams. With trembling legs, we began our hasty retreat, stumbling through the underbrush and over fallen logs. Adrenaline coursed through my veins, pushing me forward despite the exhaustion that weighed heavy on my limbs. The air hung heavy with tension and the pungent scent of fear. As we made our way through the darkness, a swarm of bats suddenly erupted from the forest canopy. Chaos ensued, and one of the creatures became entangled in the hair of the man closest to me. His panicked cries mingled with the flapping wings of the bat, creating a cacophony of terror. It was a moment of sheer terror, amplifying the already unsettling atmosphere surrounding us. Seeking safety and solace, we pressed on, desperately hoping to leave the haunted echoes of the banshee's screams behind. Our path led us through an area enveloped in a putrid odor, a stench that defied description. It was as if the very essence of fear and decay had taken physical form, assaulting our senses and leaving us gasping for fresh air. Eventually, we emerged from the depths of that haunted night, stumbling into the dim light of dawn. Exhausted and shaken, we collapsed onto the forest floor, grateful to have escaped whatever malevolent presence had haunted our wilderness retreat. My cousin and I were on our second elk hunt. It was rifle season in the Oregon Cascades. We had been hunting hard and were pretty much exhausted from hiking and trying to locate elk. We decided that we would hit up a small valley that everyone else was avoiding due to terrain and vegetation. Beginning of our backpack hunting, we left camp at 3 a.m. and set out to a point that overlooked a corner of an old burn that had a small river flowing through the bottom. After a couple hours of fighting with rhododendrons, we came out to the burn and shortly after we got to our destination. About noon, we were deciding that no animals existed in the area and were about to leave when I just happened to glance over at a patch of blowdown and saw a nice 5x5 five five stand up. I blurted out Bull. Thankfully, he was far enough away that I didn't spook him. After a while of trying to decide what to do, we got close enough or so I thought for a reasonable shot. I missed twice. After a few minutes of looking around, he trotted down to a meadow that was significantly deeper into the burn and valley. We decided to get closer and try again. We made it to a little hill that looked over the meadow, but were running out of light and the wind was all wrong. By this point, the bull and his small herd had bedded down just off to the side of the meadow. We were around four to five miles from the camp and had some really gnarly terrain to get through. I figured we probably wouldn't get another chance at the bull if we left and thought the herd might stay and come back out to feed in the morning. We went to the backside of the little hill and made a half ass shelter with rocks and sticks. I made a small fire and we went to sleep. I awoke in the middle of the night to my phone vibrating. It was a message from my wife on my Garmin. She said that she hoped we were able to make it back to the truck because the weather forecast called for three feet of snow in the higher elevations of the Cascades. I was thinking about how crappy the situation had become when I started hearing strange sounds coming from the bottom of the hill, down by the water. It sounded like a mix of laughter and crying with some noises almost sounding metallic. Think rusty gate hinges, 
I woke my cousin up, and he was just as disturbed by it as I was. We stayed silent and just listened. It was downright creepy and lasted until around 4 a.m. Needless to say, we didn't sleep. We did see the elk again, but didn't take a shot because of the upcoming storm. Never figured out what the noise was either. My story starts about 25 years ago, 17 years old. I used to take a shortcut through the woods, Freeport, Long Island, New York, and heading towards the shortcut, I'd say maybe about 12 blocks, I had to go through like a marshy swamp area. About a hundred yards in, it's dark. It's in the back of an old railroad station. No lit light. You could barely see. You could barely see 20 or 30 yards. About a hundred yards in there, I had to follow a trail along a fence. I had to sit down to smoke a cigarette. I'm sitting there, 17 years old. I'm not scared of much, especially growing up in New York. All kinds of surprises, until after this experience. So out in the marsh, I'm sitting down and out in the marsh, I hear some dog tags, you know, clanking together. I didn't think much of it. There are a lot of dogs out there goofing off. And as I sat there, the chains just started coming closer. The tags were clinking and clanking and started coming closer. So I'm thinking a dog's on its way, no big deal. No need for alarm as my ears, I couldn't really see. To my left was a creek that came out of a pipe that came from under the property. It wrapped around in front of me to about a 10 or 12 yard drop to the creek. The creek's about 10 yards and a sandbank on the other side. Then there's some type of marshy small trees, and then you could see maybe 10 or 20 yards past the creek. Those clanking sounds are coming closer and closer. My ears are telling me that it should be visible soon should be coming into my range. And I still thought it was a dog, so I'm expecting to hear a little critter, you know, coming through the grass and the leaves and whatnot. And I hear two footsteps. I hear something with two footsteps. Thump, thump, and it's coming towards me. Not a French poodle. Not a German shepherd. Two distinct footsteps coming through and you can hear the grass and the walking and the dog chains are still clinking clinking. That's about when my alarm bell went off. I'm thinking, okay, this is a problem. There's no way you can think this is anything but a problem. Something's wrong and my ears are telling me that I ought to be able to see this thing and it should be right there on the other side of the creek. This kinda just dragged on for about 20 minutes. It didn't just walk up. I'm thinking serial killer. I'm thinking something. I didn't know. Just bad. And I was ready to go because I should have seen it. My ears are telling me it should be there, but I couldn't see it. And I'm looking around trying to figure should I go back to the right or should I go to the left. And I'm in New York, so it's not always a friendly place. And I'm out in the middle of this swamp and you can't see that good. To get to the back street of the neighborhood I was heading to, I had to make a left about 10 yards, go across the pipe to the right, go another 25 yards then up the side of the hill. It brings me to the dead end street, straight up there to the neighborhood, and I have about 30 more blocks to my house. And the trail on the other side went away from the creek. So whatever would have been done there on that bank would have had a 30-yard trip to where it was, and I had a 30-yard trip to where it was. So I got up and bolted. I figured I'd beat it. I hang to the left, run to the right, and I'm in full sprint. I'm the athletic type. I'm six foot two. And just where I got to the point where I would go up this hill, a 10 or 12 foot shadow with red beady eyes stepped up from the bank and was standing right there. 10 or 12 feet. Huge. It had horns. I froze. It had horns. Just an outline. It was as dark as dark could be. All you could see is dark. All you see was an outline. Looking into this creature, it was as dark as night. Red beady eyes. Beady, not just glowing eyes. Red beady eyes, and I froze. I was just stuck. And I don't know how long I was there. I stood there contemplating some kind of communication coming at me, like step into me or something. I didn't know. 
But I didn't want to touch it, so I did what any red-blooded 17-year-old would do in this situation. I turned around and I ran. And I ran. And I didn't stop running. I ran all the way home. This was like 40 blocks, you know. This was like two miles. I came home sweating, huffing. My parents kind of looked at me odd. I was well raised, you know. Yes, sir. No, sir. No, ma'am. Catholic boy. I was in an almost shock. I couldn't explain to them what happened. I didn't dare. They would have committed me. They would have sent me to private school or something. I told one person in my life. I grew up in Catholic schools and I tried to tell my priest. Bell asks what he thought the creature was. It was just a definition to figure out that life wasn't what I had figured out at that point. It was something that alienated me from what I considered normal. I was in the U.S. Air Force 1962-1970 and volunteered to go to Vietnam in 1965. I got orders to go to NHA Trang, but when I arrived in Saigon, I was instead sent to Thailand and ended up at Udorn RTAFB which in the north close to the border of Laos. It was a small base with just a couple of hundred personnel. We didn't even have any jets, just prop planes. A couple of months after my arrival, the base started really ramping up. They built a whole new barracks area and more personnel started arriving. I was an electronics tech in the communications service. We had a tiny comm center next to the runway. There were four vans with crypto gear parked next to each other with a Quonset hut for the teletype machines centered on the vans. There was a hooch we used as the shop and a couple of others for the radios and other comm equipment. We had wooden pallets laid out for sidewalks as it got pretty muddy during monsoon season. At the end of one walkway we had a water buffalo, a big water tank on wheels that held our drinking water. During night shift it was the newest guy's job to make coffee for everyone in a big urn. You'd carry the urn out to the water buffalo, fill it bring it back and do your thing. So one night, this had to be in early 67, as we were already living in the new barracks. But the new comm center wasn't completed, yet the new guy hauled the urn out to make coffee. After a while, somebody noticed he hadn't returned and went looking for him. He found the urn laying on the ground by the water buffalo, but no sign of the airman. We went on alert, the base was locked down, and a big search started. He was gone. Naturally, we all assumed he had been snatched by the path at Lao, Lao's version of the Viet Cong. What we couldn't figure out was how they could have penetrated into the center of the base, and why grab an 18-year-old airman third-class teletype operator. Due to the treaty with Thailand, we couldn't carry arms, so it was up to the air police to tighten up security. We were pretty spooked. Probably a good thing we didn't have guns. Haha. Uh -huh. So three days later, I was in my hooch, and a guy came running in saying they found the missing guy. They found him on the ground right next to the water buffalo. Now, the missing guy's hooch was right next to mine, so I went in there. A minute later, he came in, escorted by an AP, and started grabbing his stuff and throwing it in his duffel bag. I asked him what happened, and he said, I've been ordered not to talk about it. So I asked him where he was going, and he said, to Japan. The app was very uncomfortable and told me not to talk to him, so I shut up. I looked him over as he packed and could see he was in fine shape. He was clean and all I could see wrong were three or four scratches on his cheek. He finished up, said bye, and off they went. We never saw him again and never heard anything else about the matter. We all shrugged our shoulders and figured the path at Lao weren't the type that beat up their captives. We couldn't figure how they penetrated the base twice, though. We figured it was just to intimidate us, and things just went back to normal. I was happy when we got moved into the new comm center and away from that spooky spot by the runway. So years later in the 90s, I was watching a TV show about alien abductions, and they said something about the victims having skin samples scooped out of their cheeks. I suddenly flashed back to that event and remembered the marks on that airman's face. Could it have been? Yes. 
Yesterday, I took my son fishing. He wanted to go to a nearby lake that we haven't been to in quite some time. It's not known to be a great area. For some background, the last time we went about a year ago, a car drove by and screamed, nice ass, at me while I stood there with my young son. This kind of garbage behavior is unfortunately expected in the area. It's also known to be a late night hookup spot as well as a late night drug deal location. Due to the lake's reputation, I had made a deal with my dad that I wouldn't stay there past 4 p.m. without him. On to the story. My 12-year-old son who looks much younger than he is, and I pulled up at our favorite fishing spot, a small pond on the opposite side of the road as the lake. Almost immediately, an older gentleman approached us asking if there were fish in the pond. I replied that we had just gotten started, so nothing yet, but that we had caught fish in the pond on plenty of other occasions. He thanked us for the information and returned to his spot on the other side of the road. About 15 minutes later, another younger man approaches the older man with a dog. I can see and hear them chatting, but they've made no move to involve us in the conversation, which I'm glad for. I just want to enjoy a day with my son. Unfortunately, the water in the pond was incredibly low and murky, and I could tell we weren't going to have any luck. I tell my son to pack it up and we'll try another spot on the other side of the lake. As we begin packing our gear into the trunk, the younger man yells over, Sorry if my dog and I ran you off. I tell him it's no problem, and we were simply moving to a better fishing spot. He then starts telling me how nice it is to see a mom taking her kid fishing, how you don't see that very often, etc. I get this a lot, so I'm pretty used to it. We have a short conversation about it as I pack up, and I then move towards the driver's side doors to depart. Before I can leave, the younger man starts up another conversation, this time asking me how old I think he is. This feels strange to me, but I'm nice to a fault sometimes, so I answer his question. I tell him I'm a horrible judge of age, but maybe 25. He tells me he's 38 and I'm too kind and I laugh it off saying something like, I work with teenagers, so they always guess me well above my age just to be mean. He asks where I work and I stupidly tell him my city. Turns out he lives there too and starts going on and on about how he got a free apartment on such and such street because his baby mama kicked him out of their house. I think he's talking about some kind of government assistance program. Weird flex, but okay man. At this point, I'm standing by the car door with my hand on the handle, and my son is already in the back seat. This guy can't take the hint and starts telling me all about his awful baby mama and how women are supposed to be submissive, quiet, and do what they're told. He specifically said, I mean, it's cool that you can bait a hook or whatever, but you're still a woman. Now my alarm bells are blaring. This guy struck up a conversation by commending me for doing a typically dad thing with my kid. Now he's putting me down for the same thing. He's gone from being overly friendly and complimentary to agitated and ranting. I should have been rude and just got in the car and left, but I've unfortunately been conditioned like many women to be polite even when we're uncomfortable. Instead, I start making comments in the hopes he'll see I'm not some meek submissive woman who's going to agree with him. After all, I'm a tatted up chick with an eyebrow piercing and two lip piercings. I don't exactly look like a submissive little housewife. I guess I was trying to make him just as uncomfortable as he made me in the hopes he'd leave me alone. After he says women shouldn't be loud or opinionated, I tell him, oh, well, you wouldn't like me at all. He tries to backpedal saying, I mean, it's okay to be loud, I guess, but don't try that with your man, you know? I say, my man doesn't tell me shit. I do what I want. This kind of back and forth goes on for a while before he finally shakes his head and says, I just don't understand what kind of woman would act like that. I reply, a strong one. As soon as the words left my mouth, the older gentleman yells from his spot on the bank, yeah, say that again, honey. This distracted the creep long enough for me to hop in the car and lock the doors. I still don't feel safe, though. 
Unbeknownst to Creepazoid, only two of my car doors actually have functioning locks, but at least they're the two on his side. I put the key in the ignition and turn. No dice. Nothing. Of all the times for my car to act up, it chooses now. Panic has now set in. As I repeatedly try to start my car, I can see him out of the corner of my eye. He's taken notice of my car troubles and is trying to get my attention. As he takes a few steps towards my car, the engine finally roars to life and I peel out of there. Only then do I let my composure crumble and have a long talk with my son about what just happened. To the older gentleman who took notice of my discomfort and provided a distraction, I'd gladly meet with you again any day. To the younger, misogynistic creep, I don't know if I was actually in any danger from you, but my gut said I was. Let's never meet again. Oh, and to my dad, I'll make you a new deal. I'm never going to that lake alone again, regardless of the time of day. Probably too late chime in and not me, but back in the 70s my father used to fly freelance charter jobs. One job was flying a dead guy to his funeral destination. On the way there he ran into some bad weather. Turbulence ensued. He started hearing a strange sound. A human sound. The dead guy behind him was gasping moaning. Sounded like a forceful her, her. Before you start thinking the dead guy wasn't actually dead, he was. The rough turbulence was forcing air out of the cadaver's lungs producing the sound. This is a true story I long awaited to share with your community. So last month I had another encounter with Bigfoot. I was out elk hunting near the Oregon coast, exploring the mountains behind Cannon Beach. I had reached the area near Grassy Lake, accessed by Buchanan Creek Road, just past the fish hatchery. As luck would have it, I had spotted a herd of 25 elk emerging from a thicket and managed to shoot a bull. After gutting and quartering the elk, I decided to do some further exploration in the vicinity with my 1989 Ford Escort. Having some time to spare, I grabbed my fishing pole and began ascending towards Grassy Lake. However, before I could get too far away from my car, I heard a strange sound coming from about 250-300 yards away. Curiosity peaked, I noticed a distinct hump amidst a grove of young Christmas trees, about eight half feet tall. Intrigued, I returned to my car to retrieve my rifle and peered at the hump through my 35 power scope. To my surprise, I observed a hand rising up, pushing one of the trees down. At that moment, I thought I was merely witnessing the rear end of a bear. I continued observing for about an hour and a half, convinced that the bear was unaware of my presence. As a light rain mixed with snow began to fall, I grew somewhat bored and decided to honk the horn of my car. Instantly, the creature's head shot up, towering a foot and a half above the trees. It was then that I realized I was looking at another one of those things. After scanning its surroundings, the head returned to its previous activities, completely disregarding my presence. Another half an hour went by, and the creature remained motionless. I decided to walk up the road behind the Bigfoot on a cliff to get a closer look at what it was doing. The creature was chattering, emitting deep, hollow noises resembling pig grunts. Even from a distance of 150-200 yards, I could see its hands engaged in some sort of activity. I noticed another white truck passing along the road, engaging in what appeared to be road hunting. Sensing the approaching vehicle, the Bigfoot lowered itself to the ground until the truck had passed, and then it rose back up. Frustrated by the interruption, I fired a rifle bullet into the air. Startled, the creature's head snapped back up, its gaze frantically searching the surroundings. It locked eyes with me, seemingly unbothered by my presence, as if it couldn't care less who saw it. The creature continued flipping its arm upwards, chattering and stomping its foot, as if urging me to leave. To further deter it, I fired a second round. It shot me a disdainful look before finally departing sprinting towards a nearby hillside ridge with astonishing speed. 
It effortlessly traversed the mildly rough terrain in a mere minute and a half before disappearing into the steep Oliver Canyon. The ravine, with its 200-foot depth, provided me with a glimpse of the creature as it moved further into the distant forest, eventually vanishing from sight. Intrigued, I descended to investigate what the Bigfoot had been doing. To my astonishment, I discovered a dead coyote caught in an animal trap. The coyote's neck was broken, with a pool of blood and scattered coyote hair surrounding it. The creature had devoured the entrails and rear half of the animal, leaving only the head and front legs behind. Perhaps if I hadn't scared it away, it would have finished its meal. Coyote hind legs are said to be particularly tender, while the front legs are more muscular. As darkness settled in, I made my way back, planning to return the next day. When I returned to the site the following day, I discovered 24-inch long footprints left behind by the towering 10-foot-tall Bigfoot. Additionally, I found 10 strands of 5-inch long hairs clinging to a tree branch. As I reached the base of the 200-foot ravine where the Bigfoot had made its impressive jump, I encountered two deep footprints embedded in the soil. Intrigued, I decided to follow the creature's trail back into the hills. The path exuded a sweet, putrid stench reminiscent of something deceased. Eventually, I stumbled upon a cave fairly spacious inside, with a pool of water sourced from a nearby spring. It appeared as though something had slept there, though I couldn't rule out the possibility of it being a bear's den. This story takes place in August of 2013 in the mountains of Southern Oregon. I am a USAF Security Forces Airman Military Policeman. My girlfriend was at work, and as a swelteringly hot day began to turn into thunderstorms, my buddy Nick another military cop, and I decided to go explore some back roads and get out of the heat in town. Southern Oregon is crisscrossed with logging roads, some actively used, and many totally forgotten and grown over. Nick and I spent many of our days off starting on roads that we knew, finding roads we didn't know, driving for hours into the mountains, eventually navigating back to paved roads. On this particular day, with storm clouds building over the mountains, we set off on a road we had never been on and began the drive into the mountains. After driving for around an hour, we hadn't seen nor heard any signs of other people in the woods. We rounded a bend in the thick fir woods and emerged in a meadow that was totally surrounded by thick aspen groves. The meadow was perfectly flat and eerily still. We both noticed the strange stillness almost immediately. No birds, hardly any insect noise, no squirrels, and certainly no other people. On the far side of the meadow, right at the edge of the tree line, there was a picnic table. The table was very odd, however. It was painted a bright orange and was much larger than a typical picnic table in a park. Remarking on this, Nick drove through the meadow to get a closer look. I remember being apprehensive as we approached. The whole scenario was exceptionally strange. The overall silence of the aspen grove was unsettling. Also, it was nearly impossible to see far into the trees as aspens grow extremely close together. When we parked by the table, I hopped out of the passenger seat of the truck to check it out. I'm not very tall, only about 5 feet 5 regardless, the table was ridiculously oversized and practically unusable. The seats were nearly at chest level, meaning I would have to climb up to even sit on them. As I was looking at the table, Nick called me over to the truck, and I noticed he was looking back into the aspens. At first, I couldn't see what he was looking at, but then I noticed a splash of color that was completely out of place in the thick trees. A small one-man tent was set back in the trees, about 50 feet from the strange table. I had an initial feeling of dread, and felt certain that there was someone in the tent, and if we could see the tent, they could see us. There were no campgrounds in this area, no people, no main roads for miles. Surely someone camping so remotely would be, at the very least, a strange person. However, as we observed the tent, we didn't see any movement or hear any sounds coming from it. 
Nick suggested I call out. I didn't want to, but I did. Hey, anyone in there? I yelled. No reply. Feeling completely on edge, Nick and I thought about driving away and leaving this strange area. But we began to fear the worst. What if there was a body in the tent? What if somebody had gotten kidnapped? Foolish, I know, but we thought it all the same. After some debate, we decided to have Nick turn the truck around to drive away from the camp. Should we need to leave in a hurry, he would be waiting behind the wheel. With my heart pounding, I started walking through the trees towards the tent. I was totally keyed up with my senses on full alert. When I reached the campsite, several things struck me as odd. Backpacks were scattered all over. No fire had been built, no wood collected. The tent. The tent was literally full of backpacks and women's clothing. Full of dread, I turned to leave and tell Nick what I had seen. As I left, I heard Nick start yelling. Let's go. Let's get the F out of here. Not knowing why he was yelling, I ran back to the truck. When I broke out of the trees, I saw a beat up old Ford Taurus on the road, blocking us from leaving the meadow. I immediately leapt into the passenger seat and Nick floored the gas pedal. The car was occupied by two men. A third person was laying against the window in the back. As we drove across the meadow, the driver attempted to block us from the road, but Nick drove around them and accelerated the way we had come from. I looked back and saw the car attempting to turn around on the narrow road. Nick drove like a madman, and though I was honestly terrified that they would catch up, we hit the, the highway without seeing the car again. I still do not know if the person in the back was male or female. I called the state police, and they promised to send a trooper out to check out the scene. However, I received a call the next day from a trooper stating that the campsite, the backpacks, and the women's clothing was all gone, though he could tell people had been in the area. The strange table was still by the thick aspen grove. I have not returned to the area, and do not intend to. This happened about 15 years ago back in Mexico. Me and my dad along with some friends were out in the woods gathering firewood. A old dirt road used mainly by cattle and ranchers. No other traffic that far out. Ten minutes later this nice new truck with tinted windows coming from the opposite direction stops maybe 25 feet in front of my dad's truck. We could hear somebody crying in the truck, most likely a woman, but I'm not sure but me being like 10 didn't think much of it and continued to grab fallen branches. The truck just stopped, but no one got out of the vehicle. My dad told us that it was enough for the day and it was getting dark. All the older guys in the group seemed to know something was up and jumped in the truck in a hurry. I even got my finger smashed on the door because of it. But again, I didn't think much of it aside from my finger getting bloodied. I remember my dad driving fast. They talked and murmured, but it was grown-ups talk to me, and all I could think of was my finger and the pain. When we got back to the town, my dad pounded a few beers and they talked. Several years later, when I was in my early 20s, that memory came back, and I connected the dots to what we witnessed. I never felt so much fear in my life before. To this date is the scariest thing that ever happened to me. I don't have the guts to bring it up to my dad, but I'm pretty sure that it was some sort of cartel-related deal, but for some reason they decided that we didn't see anything. Also, this is because back in the day and in my area, you never really heard of crime like that. The only crime was cartel on cartel super secretive crime. So I'm sure that whoever was inside probably had something to do with them, if it was cartel-related. But I can only imagine what my dad felt having me and his friends with him there and seeing something that we were not supposed to see. It could have gone terribly wrong for all of us. I used to work at a weather station in northern Canada. It was a 24-hour place, so it was manned round the clock, and often by someone who was awake. I worked nights many, many times, and I didn't see much creepy stuff, but heard a lot. 
Fairly nearby was a place where a couple of local guys housed their sled dog teams. You'd hear them yipping and barking now and then, and it was quite routine. Other times, it was apparent that a bear or wolf was over there and bugging them in their cages, because it was a lot more than normal barking. It was the sound of shit-scared dogs freaking out. I only heard this next thing happen one time, but pretty clearly something had gotten in there and killed at least one dog. I heard the sound of a living critter screaming while it was being killed, and it totally knew it. There is no other way to describe it. If you heard it, you'd know. I walked with cautious excitement through the old Comanche reservation. My name is Hosa, a young Comanche Native American archaeologist deeply connected to the rich history and spiritual traditions of my people. Today, I had stumbled upon a burial ground that had been concealed from us for centuries. As I brushed away the dirt and leaves, I uncovered ancient texts etched onto weathered stones. The symbols spoke of a forgotten era, revealing a harrowing tale of an unknown predator that had ravaged our ancestors 200 years earlier. The text spoke of its monstrous features, a beast with antlers, a snout, and six terrifying legs. The predator's insatiable appetite for blood left our people in fear and despair. Intrigued, I delved deeper into the mysterious history of our tribe. However, with every step, I couldn't shake the feeling that unseen eyes watched my every move. Strange occurrences surrounded me, the whispers of the wind carrying warnings that echoed through the trees. It wasn't long before I realized that the unknown predator described in the texts was not just a relic of the past. It was real, and it was pursuing me relentlessly. Fear coursed through my veins as I witnessed its monstrous presence in deep woods while I was hunting, its antlers piercing the night sky and its six legs propelling it with unimaginable speed. Determined to protect my people and unveil the truth, I embarked on a perilous journey. Armed with knowledge and guided by the spirits of my ancestors, I sought to confront the predator head-on. It was a battle of survival, a clash between human will and primordial terror. After many heart-stopping encounters, the ultimate twist revealed itself a betrayal that cut me to my core. Our tribe leader, the one whom I trusted and respected, had concealed dark secrets that were meant to stay buried. The predator, it turned out, was somehow linked to our own people's history, a curse that had been hidden for generations. With clarity, I understood that the responsibility to end this cycle of fear and betrayal fell upon my shoulders. Armed with my ancestral bow and arrows, I faced the predator in a final showdown. Adrenaline surged through my veins as I unleashed a barrage of arrows, each one finding its mark until the beast finally fell. As the life drained from its monstrous form, it vanished before my eyes, leaving behind only a lingering sense of victory mingled with sorrow. I had fulfilled my duty, but the wounds of betrayal ran deep within my soul. In the end, I emerged from this terrifying ordeal with a newfound strength and resilience. The burial ground, once shrouded in darkness, had now been exposed to the light. I vowed to protect my people and ensure that the sins of the past would never haunt us again. For it is through the wounds of betrayal that we learn the power of our own spirit and the strength to build a brighter future. I am a biologist, and one of the perks of the job is being able to see some remote and spectacular places that people don't see very often. Part of my work involves collecting insects from remote waterholes out in the middle of Australia, a few hundred kilometers north of Uluru. One of the ladies I work with, Alice, lives out there full time, spends a lot of time out bush, and has spent a lot of time with the local Aboriginal people, so she has a trove of stories and weird experiences. But I'll just tell you about the one I had. So as I said, I visit a lot of waterholes out there. Being a very arid region, these waterholes hold great spiritual and cultural significance to the indigenous people. Most, if not all of them, are sacred in some way, and they all have traditional stories attached to them. 
So one day, four of us headed out to this particular site, a full day of heavy four-wheel driving through the Fink Gorge. We get there not long before sundown, and as we pull up, there is a black dingo standing in the spot we are going to camp. He stares at us for a bit, then disappears off into the bush as they do. This in itself isn't weird. Plenty of dingoes out there and they come in a range of colors. Not that common to see a black one, but they are around, so that's fine. We set up camp, have a nice night of looking for pythons and drinking wine, yup, biologists. We slept in swags kind of like a tent that just fits a sleeping bag and sometimes has a little fold-up netting bit so you can sit up in there. It was really windy that night, so no problems with spooky noises, and I went to sleep pretty quickly. That night I had a really vivid dream about the black dingo coming into camp, sniffing around my swag and scratching at the netting trying to get in. It bothered me and I woke up, but went back to sleep pretty soon after. Still, not so weird. We woke up in the morning, did our sampling, packed up camp and started off on the long drive back to town. After we have been driving for a bit, Alice starts talking about how seeing the black dingo at the campsite when we got there really freaked her out. She didn't say anything earlier because she didn't want us to be spooked. Turns out that in the traditional folklore, that waterhole is protected by a black dingo spirit. The last time Alice camped there with other people, one of them had a dream that a black dingo came up to their swag and started attacking her. This lady woke up with long, deep scratches all over her face and no reasonable explanation for them. I had no idea of this story before I had the dream and didn't mention it to anyone that morning. There is definitely a special feeling to a lot of these places. Very hard to describe. When you are out in this country, these kinds of weird semi-spiritual coincidences are commonplace. I have some more stories, but I'm typing on my phone and my thumbs are sore. My father had always been drawn to the great outdoors. Growing up, he would often accompany my grandfather on their expeditions exploring various places with a sense of curiosity that seemed to run in the family. It was no surprise that my father eventually became a park ranger, immersing himself in the beauty of nature and creating countless memories for our family. There was a particular holiday season when the National Park welcomed an influx of tourists seeking adventure. Some were simply looking for a fun experience, while others were engaged in field research. Among them was a team of five researchers, a group that stood out with their intelligence and sanity, surpassing even the most educated of visitors. Late one night, my father received a distress signal on his walkie-talkie from one of his fellow researchers. Equipped with his trusty rifle, he embarked on a mission to investigate. As the terrain became impassable for his jeep, they continued on foot, deciding to split up and search in two different directions to cover more ground. To ensure their safety and avoid getting lost, they tied ribbons along their respective paths yellow for my father and blue for one of his partners. As my father ventured deeper into the woods, he found no trace of the rest of the group. Attempting to contact his partner through the walkie-talkie proved futile. There was no response. Undeterred, he pressed on, tying ribbons along the way. However, he began to notice something peculiar. He kept encountering yellow ribbons tied to trees, suggesting that he might have taken a different route than he intended. After a brief rest under a tree, he examined one of the ribbons more closely and realized it wasn't the same ribbon he had tied earlier. These ribbons appeared weathered and worn, and unlike his single knot, these were double knotted. This raised a sense of unease within him. The area they were in was restricted, reserved for important personnel only. Who could have journeyed this far and tied these yellow ribbons? Determined to unravel the mystery, my father decided to follow these unfamiliar markers, hoping they would lead him to the correct ones. 
As he retraced his steps, he heard faint sounds and noticed flickering lights emanating from a certain direction. Curiosity got the better of him, and he cautiously approached the source of the commotion. To his horror, he stumbled upon a group of researchers wearing bizarre attire, engaged in a macabre dance around a central fire. Four individuals were present, but one was conspicuously missing. Hidden behind a tree, my father observed as two members of the group emerged from the woods, carrying a large wooden branch with a man bound to it. The man's hands and legs were tightly secured, and it was evident that he had met a grim fate he had been prepared for some horrific ritual cooked alive. Shaken by what he had witnessed, my father attempted to contact his partner for assistance, yet no response came. Realizing the danger he was in, he decided to make his escape. As he turned to flee, he sensed a lingering presence, something lurking in the shadows. These cannibalistic murderers were still pursuing him. In a desperate attempt to divert their attention, my father climbed up a tree, silently praying that they would leave. From his vantage point, he observed their ghastly appearance emaciated, white-skinned creatures resembling humans, but with grotesque features. Their hollowed-out eyes and elongated fangs sent chills down his spine. Finally, they dispersed, unaware of his hidden perch. Carefully descending the tree, my father cautiously scanned his surroundings, ensuring the creatures were gone. Exhausted and drained, he began to lose consciousness. It was then that he realized he had been poisoned, some unknown substance seeping into his skin. Collapsing onto the forest floor, his next recollection was waking up in a hospital bed. When my father recounted the harrowing incident to senior officials, they dismissed his claims and denied any clearance he had held. It wasn't long after that he was stripped of his position as a park ranger, stripped of everything he had worked for in his career. Subsequently, he received multiple death threats, a grim reminder of the sensitive information he possessed, and the things he had seen that fateful day an ominous secret that could never be allowed to reach the public. When in the RAF I was based at Scampton, this was the base where the Dambusters raid was launched from and a bomber command airfield during the war. I was on guard duty one night and had a phone call around 2 a.m. about noises coming from one of the hangars. Sent a guard to investigate, he radios back and says he can hear voices mumbling and what sounds like machinery operating and tools clanging, etc. I got out the keys to the hangar and on driving up sure enough, there were such noises going on and the occasional flickering light. We called in the RAF police dogs, but the land shark refused to go in. This highly trained attack dog lay down, whimpered, and refused to listen to its handler. I went in with the guard and the RAF policeman, and can only describe the feeling on entering the hangar floor as being surrounded in a cold fog that you couldn't see and a real feeling of dread. There was a real feeling of unhappiness in the place. I have never felt like that since, nor do I ever want to. We hightailed it out as it was secure, and there was clearly no one there. Found out about a year or so later, when speaking to some visiting bomber command veterans, that it was a hangar used in the war for battle repairs on the damaged aircraft, and sometimes were aircraft which had crew members killed in them, and sometimes it took some time to either extract their bodies or gather up the bits would be taken to be cleaned. I have been back to Scampton since, but I give that hangar a very wide berth. I grew up on an Indian reservation here in Oklahoma. I am Cherokee Indian. Our home was by a massive cave system and in the middle of two hills. There is a cave on the property that everyone on the reservation knows Sasquatch exists. It is common knowledge where we come from. We would know their moods just by the sounds he made. 
When he was upset, you would know it because his anger would be heard throughout the whole reservation. People talked about it in casual conversation. For instance, did you hear Sasquatch upset last night, etc. My grandparents told me not to fear him because they had a pact with him and he would not harm us. All was good until more Sasquatch came. These were evil ones, not the same as the Sasquatch that had always been there. He had been run off from the territory, we believe. I had to walk down a long dirt road to get to my school bus. They would chase me up in the woods, whooping and throwing rocks at me. I was terrified and I got a feeling they wanted to hurt me. It kept getting worse. I refused to even walk to school after that. At night, when my cousins would come over, we would all play outside in the front yard. These new Sasquatch would gather around in the hills with their glowing red eyes and watch us. I know if our parents would have not been out there, they would have taken us and harmed us. I could feel it. I could sense their body and their bad intentions. I told my family that they were bad. My uncle did not listen. He went for a walk alone to the water, which was like a mile and a half from his house. He was drowned in knee-deep water and was an avid swimmer. No wounds, just a mysterious death. But I knew they killed him. He was the first of many unknown mysterious deaths that started to occur by the water. In that area, the person was always alone. It was always a mystery. I'm glad I stuck with my gut feelings because they were getting more aggressive every day that I walked to school. I believe my instincts saved my life. To this day, they are still killing people in the area. The person is always alone and the death is always a mystery. But I know and so do the other people on the reservation. Always follow your instincts. I'll send you more stories at a later date. Thank you for reading. Back to Creepy. This was out by a campground of several natural springs. A friend and I same buddy from before decided to strike out and go explore some very dilapidated and ancient looking farm structures we'd seen earlier in the day. We decided to go at night because F being sane, right? It was a small cluster of buildings far off next to some woods. We hiked through the brush to get there, but there was also a really torn up, weed-choked dirt road that led to it. The buildings were completely decrepit and looked like they were going to collapse if we breathed too hard. We went to the biggest barn-like building and immediately began to smell death. As we got to the interior, we noticed some really unnerving things. First, despite the fact that these buildings no longer had any functional purpose, it was clear that people still went out there. There were fresh footprints that did not belong to us. Second, there seemed to be blood spattered all over the place. Third, there were pieces of wood that had been sharpened into crude, short stakes that were absolutely drenched in blood. Fourth, there were scattered clumps of what looked to me at least to be human hair. Lastly, it looked like someone had used the blood-stained stakes to try and scrawl something on a couple walls and on a load-bearing post in the center of the building. I couldn't make it out probably better that way. So yeah, we decide to GTFO immediately. We decide to leave via a slightly different route because we were ultra paranoid that someone was watching and would follow us back to camp. As we made our way back, we hit a truly putrid wall of that death stench again. We found the source. It was the rear half of a calf. Just the rear half. The front half was absolutely nowhere in sight. The worst thing about it, though, is that this animal was cut clean in half. It did not look like an animal attack at all. No other wounds, just perfectly snipped in half. We made it back to camp and left the next morning. I was 1617 around 2009 with a group of friends eight of us maybe walking down my block in Forest Park, Illinois, 
heading towards one of my friend's house. It was summer, around 9 p.m. The sun was already set. Once we made it to the end of my block at an intersection, perched atop of 20 feet street light was a figure. Humanoid, definitely, but with wings standing relatively still. I and all of my friends saw it. Started out it for maybe a few seconds, all muttering WTF. After those seconds of collective confusion, the thing spread its wings fully. I don't think either of us saw it fly off or anything because the moment it did that, we all took off running. Half of us one way and the other half another. Guessing neither of us has ever run that fast in our lives. I eventually made it to the friend's house we were originally intending to get to. Obviously, we were freaked out, asking each other WTF did we just see. Honestly, really not talking about it too much after the situation. I'm 29 now. None of those friends that I still keep in contact with remember seeing red eyes. But everything else was the same as how the Mothman is described. At this time, neither of us had even heard of the Mothman, or even that there has been a sighting in the Chicago area. But I, without a doubt, know what I saw was real, because the group saw the exact same thing at the exact same moment. If I was by myself, I don't know if I would have believed it. Honestly, we were out of there so fast that I couldn't pick up much of the vibes that it gave off. All I know is that wasn't an owl, a crane, or a drone. It kind of reminded me of the creature from the Jeepers Creepers film, if you know of that movie. I'm in the Marine Corps, not spooky in a supernatural way, but in a I can't believe they're just going to let this slide way. One of the guys in my old unit was a quiet keep to himself kind of guy, nice person, but of course he got messed with. After a while he had enough of it and explained to one of my friends that he had a stabbing list and you're the first one on it. He reports the incident, they file paperwork to process him out of the Marine Corps. After six months they just let it go. So there's a guy still on active duty with a clear mental issue and I'm just kind of waiting to see him snap. Edit. I've never personally f with any of my marines from the time I joined until now as I said, this was a friend doing this. I remember what it was like having some asshole mess with me when I was a boot just for that reason. I pride myself on treating everyone I came in contact with with respect. I've seen how people think by picking up rank, they're no longer required to work and automatically think they're special. I've made it a point to work side by side my marines instead of kicking back and supervising. I've stood up for myself and others numerous times when our worthless chain of command try to push everyone, assuming they'll just take it and never speak for themselves knowing damn well their actions aren't justified. As I've said, many military members will always F with the new guy. I don't necessarily agree with it because the only thing accomplished by that is having co-workers who have no respect for you. I can't control what others do, but I guarantee any of the marines that worked with me will tell you good things because I worked right by their side and had them call me by name and not rank. Since I don't think most military norms actually work. About a decade ago, I went looking for deer sheds in a new place here in Northeast Oregon. I had a pretty good day and picked up a few buckhorns. As a chronic sufferer from nextragitis, I was still a few miles from my truck as it was getting dark. I had stupidly left my headlight in the truck, so I knew it was going to be a long evening fumbling in the snow and deadfall timber. Right at dark, I heard a wolf howl in the bottom of the canyon, maybe three-quarter mile directly downhill big country. I thought to myself, well, that's pretty cool, then heard another respond a few hundred yards closer. I was really enjoying the experience until another responded 100 yard behind me in the pitch-black timber with a much deeper, 
gut-wrenching howl. After a moment of silence, the surrounding area ignited with howls in every which direction. No longer really enjoying the experience, I unstrapped a 4PT shed to protect myself and began the trek towards my truck which was right in line with the source of the deep, commanding howl. So off I go, and the pitch black timber, in a remote area I had never been before, with nothing but a 60 FT shed to protect myself. Meanwhile the wolves were communicating back and forth, until the alpha would howl and shut them up momentarily with the eeriest howl you can imagine. This continues as I make my way through the woods, however every time the alpha would howl, it was still 100 yards behind me. After this happens a few times, I get a solid idea of what is taking place it's following me. All I can do is keep hiking. After a while, I make it back to a trail and scoot pretty quickly back to my truck. Upon reviewing Google Earth later that night and identifying landmarks, I determined that the wolf stayed right behind me for two half miles as I fumbled my way in a V-shaped line back to my truck. The next day and subsequent weekends, I went back properly armed and counted at least 10 wolves in that pack, and was able to identify the alpha based on his howl, a big old grey colored one. I've had cats creep up on me at night, had my share of supernatural experiences none backcountry related thankfully, but nothing will make a guy feel more vulnerable than walking through the pitch black woods without a headlight, without a sidearm, not really knowing where he's going pre on X or GPS for me, and being followed by the alpha wolf. Needless to say, I now always carry a headlight, batteries, and some form of protection on me at all times. I go camping now and then, and there's really nice lake out in the woods about 3-4 hours walk east of Oslo, Norway. It's a popularish camping spot. So a friend and I are running out of firewood and it's pitch black. Bad planning plus whiskey drunk so we grab our flashlights and head out to get some more bits and pieces to keep the fire going. Now the lake is large and dotted around the lake we can see about 3-4 fires going other happy campers. One campsite in particular is rowdy. It's a good 200 meters across the lake, but we can hear them chanting and singing football songs and generally be obnoxious. It's about 2 a.m. now and we want to sleep. I can do this weird thing with my voice. I let all the air out of my lungs and then breathe in really fast and tighten my voice box. I can create this ungodly, banshee, inhuman scream that is loud and does not sound human. So I go for it. Within a second, the noise from other campsites stop and the fires are doused within 10 seconds. You could hear a pin drop all across the lake. Silence. Sheer terrified silence. Even my campmate was freaked out. He'd never heard me do it before. I'm from Victoria, Australia, and an avid hiker and camper. I feel most at home in the bush and in the mountains with my boys practicing bushcraft and survival. It's the best form of therapy. I have a deep respect for nature and believe we are not being told and taught what is really out there. My story goes back to the year 1998 when I was 18 at the time in Gippsland, Victoria. This was dairy country with beautiful rolling green hills. This night I and my friend had gone to the town of Mo to spend some time at a nightclub. The club closed around 2 a.m. so we decided to head back to my hometown of Yerrigan, which is only about a 25 minute drive. As we got on the Princess Freeway to head back to home the fog really set in. It was very thick. We had music playing and talking away about our night out, driving very slowly. Just before getting to the town of Trafalgar, there is the Trafalgar Cemetery which is just outside of the town on the left side of the highway. As we came along the road and to a slight bend which was to the left all of a sudden something jumped into the middle of the road. 
the hairs on the back of my neck are standing up. This thing was huge and I mean big. I've never seen anything like this in my life. We have no animals this big in Australia, so I've thought until this night. My friend Adam was driving. He slammed on his brakes. This creature was on all fours, but it wasn't. It was hard to describe. It just stopped and stared at us, and this thing is only 25 to 30 feet away from us, in the open and heavy fog. It was covered in hair, longer on the forearms and the legs, gray to black, silvery in the headlights. The eyes were glowing red and big. The hands, feet, and arms were massive and very long, thick, and muscular. It just sat there in a squat position. The head and face resembled a wolf, but the snout was shorter and more pushed in. The height of this thing to its head had to be at least five to six feet off the ground, and this thing is squatting, so try to picture this thing if it stood up. The shoulders had to have been three to four feet wide. It felt like a good minute of looking at each other, but it was probably closer to 10 to 15 seconds. My face was up against the windshield trying to figure out what I'm looking at. My friend Adam burst into tears instantly from fear. Being cold outside, you can see this thing taking massive inhales and exhales, and the chest moving in and out. It moved in a way like it didn't know whether to attack or flee. It was terrifying to look at. Then, all of a sudden, its body shifted to its left, and the amount of power it generated to leap itself off was the most impressive thing I have ever seen. For such a massive animal to spring itself off and bang it was gone in one bound. This is on a three-lane highway. It was in the middle. It cleared the road in one leap. I don't know how long, but it felt like a long time in silence without him crying. A part of me didn't want it to leave. This hasn't stopped me from going into the wild remote bush solo. Not my story, but a colleague's of mine. My colleague was responding to a call to check up on a camper. When he had pulled up, he noticed all the lights were out which was strange considering the call was only made a few moments prior. When this ranger approached the tent, there was nothing, not a sound. It was as if everybody in the campsite had completely disappeared, leaving only him by himself. He was puzzled and not sure why somebody would make the call of this campsite and then be completely deserted. Then he described what he could hear as a weird growling noise with kind of a chewing sound. He shines his light over in the direction of this noise and sees this tiny three-foot-tall furry humanoid thing standing there that reminded him of a chimpanzee. He was completely startled and nearly falling backwards on his behind. This thing also had a very surprised expression on its face. Not really sure what to do, it quickly ran off, scurrying between the branches and the trees and going at about 30 miles an hour. My colleague claims that it looked partly human, a brow ridge and a nose very much like a human does, but the rest of the face was almost covered in hair and reminded him very much of an ape. Besides the nose and the brow ridge, the eyes were also all black too and it did not appear to be violent or aggressive in any way. As it turns out, the campers at this campsite were being harassed by this tiny little humanoid ape thing, which is the reason why they left soon after they made the call. Apparently, this thing was trying to get into one of their tents in which they were scared and got in their car and deserted their camp. After speaking to a few friends of mine who were heavily into cryptozoology, they all believe that a juvenile Sasquatch was responsible. Under the chilling midnight sky, my friend Dell and I drove along a desolate road, enveloped in an eerie silence. Unbeknownst to us, a life-altering encounter awaited. As our eyes scanned the darkness, a graceful four-point deer emerged captivating our attention with its beauty. 
Little did we know, this sighting was merely a prelude to something far more extraordinary. On the left, the deer vanished into the shadows, diverting our gaze to the right. Dim moonlight revealed a figure that sent shivers down our spines, a towering bipedal dogman. Its immense size filled us with a primal fear that transcended the limits of our understanding. Traversing the road, the creature's passage stirred the thick line of trees, setting them in motion. We stood transfixed, unable to avert our eyes from this mysterious being that defied explanation. It possessed an allure that was both enchanting and terrifying, hinting at an existence beyond our grasp. In that fleeting moment, a sense of otherworldliness saturated the air. The dogman's powerful stride seemed to bridge the gap between our reality and the unknown. Its presence invoked a mixture of awe and fear, captivating our senses with its enigmatic nature. Despite our yearning for clarity, the darkness concealed the creature's details. Yet, even in the absence of certainty, we recognized that we had borne witness to something extraordinary, a being that transcended the boundaries of our everyday existence. As the dogman dissolved into the night, our minds teemed with unanswered questions. Who was it? Where did it come from? This encounter ignited a fervent curiosity within us, driving us to explore the hidden enigmas lurking in the shadows. Since that bewitching moment, the memory of our encounter has etched itself permanently in our minds. The indelible mark left by the bipedal dogman serves as a reminder that our world is brimming with mysteries beyond the limits of our perception awaiting discovery. I was on our property in the Mount Hood National Forest in Western Oregon. I was making a new access road for equipment to get through and had been cutting with my chainsaw for some time when I decided to take a break. I pulled my earplugs out which I normally leave in my ears. I sat there inspecting my work. Suddenly, something started crunching through the thick brush from down over the hillside in my direction straight at me. At first, I thought it was an elk but the equipment noise should have kept the area clear of most animals, and I could tell it was cumbersome and lumbered along on two feet. I started straining my eyes to see what was coming through the thicket as it approached and got closer with every step. Finally, by the sound, I knew I should be seeing it because it wasn't more than 50 feet in the brush, but I couldn't make out any dark forms at all. It was November and all the leaves were gone off the trees and plants, so I had visibility of 200 feet. Suddenly, it came to a stop. It all went silent, extremely silent. There were no typical forest noises of any kind. I could feel that I was being watched, but why couldn't I see it? Anyway, I got tired of whatever it was playing games. I put my earplugs back in fired up my saw and went back to work, keeping my eyes down low just in case it let itself be seen. I knew it was watching me, but I wasn't going to give it the satisfaction of freaking me out. I trust the Lord to keep me safe, and that thing knew it. I didn't have anything else happen that day. But when I returned the next morning, something had taken all the brush I had stacked in piles along the new road and scattered it back in my way. Again, upon noticing this, I was peering through the woods around me with my senses on edge. When my two dogs came out to visit me, they quietly walked up behind me and stepped on some branches breaking them. I about jumped into the next county. I went back to work restacking the brush and nothing more happened. About six months later though, I was in an area not far from there where I had been cutting all day, trying to get a section out of an old growth fir log for carving. It was getting close to dusk and I had my old Chevy pickup parked not far from me, about 40 feet away. I was preoccupied with what I was doing at the moment. But as I let my saw start a new cut down through the five foot log, I glanced over at my truck and they're standing alongside it, between me and the car, 
was a massive being, all black or dark brown and staring at me. I cursed under my breath because I really wasn't looking for a visit now. My truck is hot blue so this thing stood out really well against it. That rig is on 35 inch tires, a 6 inch lift with the top of the cab being about 7 feet tall and this thing's head was quickly a foot taller than the truck. I didn't stare at it or want to make a lot of eye contact with it, but I noticed it was about 4 feet wide at the shoulders and its arms hung down to its knees. It was very hairy and very solid. I'm no judge, but I'm assuming it had to have been at least 600 pounds if not more. The second I saw this thing standing there a cold shiver ran down me, but I didn't want it to think I saw it so I turned back to focus on my cutting. I didn't want to look back or head over to see if it was still there. It was now it was about 10 feet closer to me and standing more to my left near the hood of my truck. I could feel my heart pounding and I was getting a cold sweat too, but I went back to focusing on my work. I didn't look back for several minutes knowing that things could show up next to me or behind me without warning. I find the best thing to do is focus on what I'm doing and not look around and don't get let my imagination run away with me. It's easy to do out there in the dark with those Bigfoot being curious and coming around. I looked back up after five minutes and it was gone, thank God. But I'm sure it was standing in the dark there somewhere and I wasn't about to look around for it. I finished my work there, packed my tools and headed to the house without anything more occurring. The next day I went back, but after that I tried to get back before dusk. I had previously thought that they were kind of shy, but not after what I've seen. They're curious and will show up even if equipment or machinery is running. One summer, several years ago, I was spending an evening with a friend over in Washington at a rock pit we used to camp at quite a bit. Over a decade ago, she had her own encounters with the Bigfoot in which one walked up to her and her brother in the forest on Mount Hood. They were armed with AR-15s but were both frozen in fear. It got within five feet of them and just locked eyes with her. It was a nine to ten foot male and watched her intently for about a minute before turning its head and disappearing into the trees. They literally looked and looked for it, but it had vanished. This encounter happened in broad daylight. Anyway, they are amazing creatures. So this happened three years ago when I was living with my parents in Medici, Wyoming. Super small and secluded. It was Halloween and my parents decorated the house, and we expected about three, four kids to show up as the house is about a mile from a subdivision and parents usually drive their kids. At eight I took in the chair with candy because I figured no one else would be coming around. I'm in the basement where there are no windows and very little sound can get out, and it's about 11. All the lights upstairs are shut off because I'm going to bed. I hear a knock at the side door which no one ever knocks at. I go upstairs and the floodlight which usually turns on automatically wasn't on. So I flipped on the other light that lights up the basketball hoop area. There's a person in one of those old man masks that have the crazy hair just standing there. He is just looking at the house. He sprints to the back where the patio is. I hear loud banging on the back windows. Honestly, the loudest kicking I've ever heard. I rush over and the person is just staring. Then he runs away and I do tea hear anything for five minutes or so. Then I start hearing the knob to the main door being forcefully jiggled back and forth. I ran upstairs to the bedroom and went to the crawl space in the attic. I immediately dialed 911. This was the first time I ever dialed 911 so I don't know what I was expecting, but the operator didn't seem to be very shocked or wanting to send out a car very quickly. I remember repeating my address like 12 times and the lady kept saying, Calm down, sir. She wants me to stay on the line, 
But I'm afraid if the guy got in, he would know where I was because of my voice. I hang up and I can hear the knob being slammed like he had a hammer or something. I'm having a full-on panic attack and I'm wheezing trying to get air. Then I hear the side door original door being kicked super hard. At this point I'm shaking so bad the dust from the floorboards is flying up in the air. I hear a window smash and I immediately know he's going to get in. I hold my breath which makes the wheezing worse. I'm going to die. I'm listening to hear footsteps or anything. Nothing. The actual amount of time I spent up there was around 16 minutes. I swear it was an hour. An officer showed up and pounded on the door. I ran downstairs and flipped open the door. I told him everything as well as the backup sheriffs that got there. They all kept saying a friend was probably just trying to scare me. I had no friends in Wyoming. None. They looked around the house and wrote down some shit, but nothing really happened. They left and I drove behind them to Cody. Wyoming and got a hotel room. I still can't sleep without all the lights on and a .45 on my dresser. I stood atop the remote watchtower in the heart of the White River National Forest, Colorado. The breathtaking beauty of the vast wilderness stretched out before me a canvas of nature waiting to be explored. As a diligent park ranger named Zoe, I took my responsibilities seriously, ensuring the safety of visitors and the preservation of this pristine environment. But there was more to me than just the uniform I wore. In my free time, I embraced my passion for art, wielding a paintbrush instead of a ranger's guidebook. The wilderness inspired me, and I would often capture its magnificence on canvas, the colors dancing across the white expanse, bringing the landscape to life. As dusk settled over the forest, the once familiar tranquility gave way to an eerie stillness. A chill ran down my spine, and I sensed a presence lurking in the shadows, beyond the reach of my watchful eyes. Unseen entities tormented me during the night, whispering dark secrets that seemed to seep into my very being. Their voices echoed through the trees, playing mind games that threatened to unhinge my sanity. Driven by a mix of curiosity and apprehension, I stepped outside the watchtower, determined to confront the enigma that haunted my nights. I cautiously moved through the underbrush, my senses heightened and heart pounding. And then I saw it a figure in the distance, a predator with the shape of a bipedal dogman, its eyes gleaming with an unnatural intelligence. Fear surged through me, but I refused to let it paralyze me. With trembling hands, I reached for the weapon holstered at my side, knowing that my only chance of survival lay in facing this unknown creature head on. I shouted into the darkness, demanding answers, demanding to know why it tormented me. In a flash, the dogman lunged, its razor-sharp claws tearing through the air. Instinct took over, and I fought back, battling the beast with all my strength. Pain seared through my body as its claws found their mark, but I refused to yield. In a desperate struggle, I managed to seize my gun, aiming for the creature's heart. The shot rang out, piercing the night, and the dogman's agonized scream echoed through the forest. With newfound resolve, I held my breath, waiting for backup to arrive. The creature, wounded and startled, fled into the darkness, leaving me battered and bloodied but alive. Backup arrived to find me unconscious, lying amidst the wilderness I had sworn to protect. They whisked me away to safety, my body battered but my spirit unbroken. As I regained consciousness, I knew that my encounter with the dogman was not the end, but a beginning a testament to the unseen dangers that lurked within the depths of the forest. In the days that followed as I recovered, I delved deeper into the legends and lore of the area, seeking answers to the mysterious entity that had attacked me. 
It became clear that I had stumbled upon a hidden world, where myth and reality converged in the darkest corners of the White River National Forest. And so, armed with knowledge and an unwavering determination, I returned to my post atop the watchtower. The paintbrush in my hand became not only a tool of artistic expression, but a symbol of resilience. I vowed to protect this wilderness, not only from the tangible threats, but from the unseen forces that sought to unravel its delicate balance. The wilderness watched over me as I stood strong, ready to face whatever terrors may come. For in the heart of the forest, amidst the whispers of the unknown, a park ranger named Zoe embraced her duty with unyielding courage, ensuring that the secrets of the wild remained just that secrets, forever entwined with the untamed beauty of nature. So, I'm not a skeptic or anything, I just haven't dealt with much paranormal-related stuff because I steered clear of anything that could potentially haunt me. So no dolls, mirrors, paintings, etc. About a year ago, when I was staying up late sometimes, I would hear this extremely loud breathing, or at least some sort of airy movement that went on for 30 seconds whilst I just listened. It sounded the same and just as clear, even if I was in different locations for each separate occurrence. Once in the bedroom, once in the living room, and once in the home office. On the second floor, it happened in several month intervals, and it sounded consistent or mechanical, perhaps. Enough that I figured there must be some sort of normal explanation. The house is very new, 2000 tennis, no basement, no dark past or anything. What could explain that? My friend Matt lived on the corner of South Carpenter in Sleepy Hollow, New York. His house was surrounded by woods and had well water. His neighbors owned cows, horses, and many acres of land. Matt's sister was a medium and was able to communicate with spirits. She was kind of gothic and had a strange group of friends. During one birthday party, a group of goths came back terrified. They said they had seen a witch in the woods. At first, they saw an old lady from a distance, and it seemed like she was lost and looking for something. They approached her eager to help. They stepped closer and went to reach for her shoulder when she began laughing. She turned around and petrified the group. Most of the people thought the group was lying, but Matt knew his sister could tell the kids were serious too. They were actually scared, and the forest they were in was a labyrinth of spooky trees. It was easy to get turned around. Later that year, this is what happened. Matt, Bill, and I were hiking during the winter months. There wasn't snow on the ground, but the air sure was cold. We were bundled up and didn't plan on going far. But of course, we followed the trail, and it led us to a place we could never imagine. I was following Matt, but he wasn't the best with directions. We were in a thick forest that we had never explored before. We continued trekking, searching desperately for familiar territory. It was getting dark. Finally, we heard cars. We made it to the road and saw it with Sleepy Hollow. I thought it was funny and antagonized Bill and Matt about the headless horseman. But they were a little younger than me and started to cry. They were scared. It should have been straightforward to make it back to the house using the roads. But sadly, we did not make the best decisions. Matt was oblivious to the surrounding streets and directions and was clueless about how to get us back. I remember the route my dad used very vaguely and attempted to lead us back. There were no sidewalks, so we walked on the ditch alongside the forest. After a while, Bill ran ahead of me. He said something was back there, something was following us. I didn't believe him and I stopped walking. I looked back and saw that he wasn't lying. There was some kind of black upright dog just walking behind us. 
We started to jog, and so did the canine. Matt and Bill were faster than me. I told them to run ahead and that I would get this thing away from us. By that point, I had a general idea of where I was. I beelined it to the forest and caught the trail. I couldn't see much, but the trees paved the way for me. I had no visual of the dog anymore, but I knew it was on my trail. After what felt like forever, I could hear the commotion from Matt's family's party. The flames from the bonfire peeked through the trees and I felt relieved. I moved towards the tree line and suddenly went barreling into the ground. My foot caught a root and I was badly scraped up. With my hands and knees bleeding, I rolled over in slow motion and my life flashed before my eyes. I heard something crashing down the path about thirty yards from me. I hopped to my feet and went straight through the briars and branches, leaping to the illuminating grass. I made it to the fire and the creature luckily left the darkness. Matt and Bill were already sitting on their mom's lap telling the story. My parents were happy to see I was still alive, but not surprised at all. The adults saw my wounds and gasped. I told them the werewolf got me. Years later, my friend Alex moved nearby. He had two encounters with a wolfman. Once, he and his two sisters saw a large lichen creature cross the road and scale a deep hill within seconds. His other encounter was with me. We saw a pair of eyes out of his patio window in the woods. It was the scariest night of my life, and I never slept over there again. We tried to sleep in the basement, but had to go upstairs because we were terrified. A friend of mine has encouraged me to share my experience from May 2021. Iron Pot Creek Campground in Toonambar National Park, west of Kyogle, New South Wales, Australia is where it happened. I and two friends were camped there for a week, and one evening we heard a squawking, screaming sound. We turned our flashlights on a black opossum being chased by a creature that was maybe four feet tall. We watched as the creature scurried up a gum tree only a few meters away. As we followed its climb, it hopped from one tree trunk to the next tree some three meters away, apparently defying physics. As it hopped out away from the tree trunk and then moved in towards the second tree that was perpendicular to each other. One of my friends watched all of this with me and we had a lively discussion about its odd attributes but didn't think much of it. That night I awoke in my van to a juvenile one, only a foot tall with very long arms and a red face that had a pointed nose almost like a chicken's beak. I was calm enough. I turned the light on thinking it would be scared away, but I essentially needed to push it out of the van as its curiosity was strong and fear non-existent. I slammed the door and the poor thing got its foot caught momentarily but escaped. It took a few months of processing before I really could accept the fact these creatures are not something documented and are commonly known as hairy men. There was no strong smell, but a notable distortion of time. The one week time passed with ease and the days were so calm. I have had time to accept what I saw and over the past few months have shared this story recently with a friend who had his own experience in the Daintree National Park, Queensland, and encouraged me to share. I just came here today, about 20 minutes ago, and have seen two videos about the sounds. One I do believe is faked, in all honesty. One sounds like a concert in the distance. But this isn't really about the recent happenings. What I want to know is if anyone else has ever experienced this sound before. And if so, how old are you now or how old were you then when you first heard it? I've read only certain people can hear it, I think above age 25, or actually 40 and above. Myself, I'm early 30s, and I have heard the sound at least twice in my life. 
The first time was about 12 years ago. I saw something really effing scary on someone one time. It looked like a weird smile. And because he was a friend who I trusted, I felt some super deep sense of betrayal. Like, he was betraying all humans because he wasn't one. Like a demon. Yeah, I know. Crazy. But when I saw him smile that way, I heard such a sharp sound. Sounded like a trumpet, but like it was a string instrument that someone slid their fingers across really quickly and aggressively, then abruptly stopped. I used to hear this swing set all the time. For years. But when I looked for it, I couldn't find it. Then I never heard it again. And the area where I heard it, the people all still lived there. No swing set. And about a year or a year and a half ago, at a different apt building, I heard this loud rumbling. Didn't sound like a trumpet or anything. Just sounded like, I don't know, deep underground construction. But there was none, and it had come in waves each day I heard it. It'd last like 40 minutes, and there'd be like seven or so waves. It'd crescendo, then descends in a slow-ass way, then it had come back. Because of that, I googled the hum and looked up some vids about it. One vid tried to debunk it by saying it sounds like dry ice on a sheet of steel. Which does. But it's super loud, just a low bass rumble. And one dude said it's 18-wheelers slamming on their brakes. Where I live, no big trucks would really come through like that. Maybe like three a day. I can hear the traffic from where I live. I rarely heard big trucks come through, at least not slamming on the brakes. After I watched that video for about a week, I'd hear like at least 15 a day. Then after that week, it all stopped. No more big tricks slamming the brakes. And I noticed it then and there, and have paid attention to it since. Rarely do they slam on their brakes and 15 trucks doing that every day for a week is very noticeable. Strange. And another thing I want to mention is how my smaller city didn't have too many police chases. But in the last three months, I hear them like at least three or four times a week. And a neighbor is a cop, and I asked if those are actually police chases, and not just cops rushing to a crime scene. And he confirmed there's police chases happening. And I've lived in this building for a second time now for at least two years and some odd months. And another thing I want to mention is locusts. They've been appearing every year for about two months at a time right before hurricane season. For about six years, maybe seven. Again, I will mention that though I do believe in a supreme being, I'm not religious. I was raised Christian, sure, but I'm not a religious person. Not anymore. And the reason I say this is because I've noticed the religious concepts in this I'm writing right now. Anywho, what do y'all think? Have y'all noticed this stuff? And what do you think of it? Just a coincidence, and I'm being superstitious. So two of my friends snuck out last summer and took a walk listening to music decided to sit down on the road and talked a bit, and they both heard a distant scream that sounded pretty similar to an elk screech, but for like one second in duration. So they turned off the music and saw a huge humanoid horse, looking things sprint out of this forest into a field, and they said it was running really fast like 40 miles per hour. They said it was kind of hunched and had a limp, was lean but muscular, and was completely pale or gray and naked. They both sprinted home and FaceTimed each other. When they got home and told me and a few others about it the next day, I was in disbelief so I snuck out on my bike the next night with my other friend and met up with the two original people along with some others and went looking for it. We heard the noises they described and me and my one friend saw a pale Bigfoot-looking creature walk in front of someone's barn. Light like 300 yards away, but we're not sure. 
We continued to do this for a few nights, and one of them was walking to meet up with us alone to go looking for it, and had seen it like five times on the walk there, sometimes like twenty feet in front of him. We probably all went looking for it like six or seven times in total. The last time we went looking we all saw it, and it was super tall like eight, ten feet. Super fast, and had these glowing eyes you could see from a mile away. I'm pretty sure I also saw it have these long greasy locks or strands of hair about shoulder length. Looked like a mix between a crawler, a Ren Jaeger titan form, and Jeff the Killer. It was creepy. And when it was on pavement you could hear clopping noises like it had hooves or something. Aside from this, I was on a late night gas station walk later that summer with two of my friends at three in the morning. And on our way back, we saw something run or hobble across the road about 70 yards in front of us, and it looked pretty similar. However, it was much smaller, maybe 5 feet tall, but I could see it being maybe 7 feet if it was standing fully upright. Does anybody have an idea of what this massive thing could be? This was in rural northeast Ohio. Edit. Was reading this over and forgot to add. We were walking on the way back to my friend's house one of the nights and behind somebody's house, we heard the noise of a baby crying in the woods. Couldn't have been mistaken for anything else but a baby. I did my undergrad at this tiny little college in the middle of a mountain range. Literally miles and miles of woods on every side. I think about 100 acres was technically the school's property, but except for the weird high security facility a few miles to the east, none of the neighbors cared if kids went hiking onto their property as long as they weren't destructive and wore bright colors during hunting season. Had a kid the year above me get a calf full of birdshot after running into their property with a turkey call. Anyways. The point is, there is or was a lot of woods and a lot of trail markers. My now ex, still very violent or nutty fiancé, was in a grad program in the city, so we were living apart. I was planning on going on a quick two-mile walk through the woods on a well-marked trail, just to see the lake, distress from midterms, etc. Relationship was extremely rocky at this point, and I get a phone call right before I start the trail. What it was about doesn't matter. The important part was that it was essentially a napalm bomb to the heart and my trust in humanity. Not trying to be dramatic, I was just a sensitive kid. So I took off sprinting down the trailhead, tears running down my face. Figured I'd take a slightly different trail that goes up a steep incline and maybe just burn myself out. It works, kind of. I'm catching my breath and still sobbing, and I hear a group of people on the trail headed towards me. Not wanting to be known as the crying girl in the woods and not entirely in my right mind, I took off running in a random direction, passing a lot of the tree houses and forts that people make in the woods, telling myself I know where I am and that I hike these woods often, and can find my way back to either the trail entrance or to the road. I jumped two creeks, which in hindsight should have stopped me, because that meant I was straying way off campus. But I kept going, slipping on branches, and then picking a new direction to run in. I was a dumb kid. I was a really dumb kid. There were a couple turkey vultures following me, which wasn't too surprising, Kids left food out pretty often, so they tended to be watchful. On long hikes by myself, I'd often sing to them when they tagged along. I started getting tired and slowed down to a walk, heading towards a small clearing with some toppled birch trees to sit on. My face was all messed up and my hair had little sticks and leaves in it, but I wasn't crying anymore. I lit a cigarette and stared at the ground and felt pretty damn sorry for myself. At some point I stopped feeling pretty damn sorry for myself and started feeling jumpy, kind of tingly, and everything I saw had this new level of sharpness and clarity to it. 
It wasn't really a feeling that I was being watched, more like I was somewhere I really, really didn't belong. It was starting to get dark, I had no cell service, the only thing I had on me besides my phone was a lighter, pack of cigarettes, and small pocket knife. Shorts, t-shirt, light windbreaker. I was literally search and rescue's worst nightmare. Trying to calm myself down, I tried to find any trail markers. None. Didn't recognize anything around me, couldn't hear any running water, and was too turned around to know where the road was. It was getting pretty chilly, and the woods were starting to make that sound that I can only describe as teeming. I didn't want to wander in a random direction, but the feeling of dread kept getting stronger and stronger, so I slowing started walking. Started hearing things, mostly whispers, which I figured I was hallucinating due to dehydration or exhaustion. And then, the shadows. It was the strangest thing, these tall, thin shadows being cast on the trees. I would have chalked it up to the sunset, but the movement of them was unnatural, and I kept catching them in the corner of my eye. They kind of swayed, or kind of jumped. It was a strange juxtaposition between how thoroughly creeped out I was and how pretty the sunset was that night. I remember looking at the sky, trying to calm myself down and pick a direction that felt right. But no direction felt right. I kept getting turned around, heard a few distinctive twig snaps in the distance. A wicked chill ran down my spine, and at this point I wasn't thinking Eldritch Forest Elves. I was thinking Bobcat or Black Bear. Started sniffling and crying silently again because I knew I had messed up. I was fifty shades of paranoid, dehydrated, and I prayed to God hallucinating. And then I heard a rustle of wings that just about scared the shit out of me, and I looked up and there was the vulture. Just looking at me. I was so out of it that I think I asked it for help. It stared at me for a few more seconds and then took off. It landed on a branch a few meters away and stared at me doing the angry feather fluff thing that they do. Walked up to the tree it was perched in, and it took off again and landed on another branch a ways away. So I did what any sane person would do in that situation and followed the vulture. The feeling of dread slowly wore away and I started feeling okay. It was such a polite vulture, waiting for me to catch up and then flying off again. I don't remember how long I followed it, just that it was a while, and even when it was getting really twilight dusky out I still felt safe. I started recognizing landmarks glacial boulders, the tree forts, and could hear voices up ahead. The vulture lead me a few more meters, right onto the main trail, and then stayed put. I thanked it, apologized, and made my way towards the group of people camped out. I knew a bunch of the kids, they freaked out, I was promptly handed hot tea and french fries. They asked how the hell I made my way out there and I just shrugged. I didn't feel like sharing about the vulture and when I tried to spot him again he'd flown off. Here's the real scary part of the story though. No one realized I was gone. I lived alone and my friends had assumed that I wasn't answering texts because I was studying. It was also a Friday, meaning that no one would have even thought it strange I was gone, as I often left to the city without telling anyone for the weekend. Essentially, no one would have even started looking until Monday, at which point I might have been either bobcat food or a sacrifice to the dear god. So thank you my kind, kind vulture friend. Vultures are hands down my favorite animals now. I recently received a telephone call from a friend of an eyewitness who was born and raised in a northwest suburb of Chicago, Illinois. The only specific location reference was given as near the Des Plaines River. The eyewitness D discussed multiple sightings from 1978 through 1988 while he lived there as a boy. The sightings would usually occur at dusk and would continue throughout the night and there were 
At least two winged creatures always seen flying in a wide circle at an altitude of 500-600 feet. The creatures were silhouetted against the clouds that were backlit by the city lights. The description of these creatures was that there was no head or neck that could be seen. They had long, thick tails, but no legs or feet were visible. The huge wings had no feathers, but were membraned, similar to that of a dragon or pterosaur. Apparently, the neighborhood residents were well aware of the nightly sightings. I solo sail a lot. I learned to sail when I was little and have done three transatlantic cruises so far. This one time I was doing a transatlantic crossing from the Canaries to St. Lucia. It was late and I was on deck doing an equipment check as per routine when sailing alone. So I am six days into the 14 day journey and it's just nothingness all around. I mean absolutely no light save for the stars and the moon. I can literally remember this like it was yesterday because I have never seen anything like it before. I was on deck and all of a sudden it was bright, like midday full sun bright. Mind you, it was near 2 a.m. at this point, so it made literally no sense. Immediately I assumed it had to be a flare, someone needed help. I came to a full stop lowered the sails and began radioing on all the emergency channels in Spanish and English. I did this for almost two hours, circling around and checking the radio. There was nothing. Around the second hour I gave up, I marked the location of my search pattern and kept going. I had no idea what it was, never saw anything like it again. The whole night lit up like the sun was out for a good 3-4 seconds. Unbelievable. The moon hung low in the night sky as I stood outside the apartment building, my heart pounding with a mix of excitement and nervous anticipation. Today was the day I would join the ranks of the police force as a rookie officer. My name is Alex, and I had always dreamed of making a difference, of upholding justice in a world that seemed too often plagued by darkness. My partner for this first assignment was Detective Ryan, a seasoned veteran with a reputation for his sharp instincts and unwavering resolve. Together, we were tasked with investigating a homicide case, a daunting task for a rookie like me, but I was eager to prove myself. As we approached the apartment, a sense of unease settled in the pit of my stomach. The door was locked, a barrier between us and the truth hidden within. With a swift kick, Detective Ryan forced the door open, revealing a chilling scene that would forever be etched in my memory. There before us lay the lifeless body of the victim. It was a gruesome sight, a chilling reminder of the evil that lurked in the shadows. But what shocked us both was not just the presence of death, but the grotesque creature feasting on the remains. It was a dog-like creature, but larger, more akin to a wolf. Its hulking figure loomed over the body, its snarling face contorted with an unsettling mix of animalistic hunger and a twisted, human-like visage. The sight sent shivers down my spine, and I felt an instinctive urge to protect and serve, to rid the world of this abomination. Reacting on pure instinct, Detective Ryan and I drew our weapons and fired at the creature, hoping to neutralize the threat it posed. But the bullets seemed to have little effect. It let out a chilling growl, launching itself at us with a speed and strength that defied logic. Caught off guard, we were tackled to the ground, our bodies hitting the floor with a resounding thud. The creature slipped away from our grasp, a blur of fur and teeth, disappearing into the night before we could regain our footing. The chaos and confusion that ensued left us breathless, questioning the reality of what we had just witnessed. We exchanged bewildered glances, our faces etched with disbelief and uncertainty. Did we really see what we think we saw, 
Or was it some hallucination brought on by exhaustion or something we inadvertently ingested? The questions lingered in the air, a heavy fog obscuring the truth. With a deep breath, Detective Ryan and I collected ourselves, determined to make sense of the inexplicable. We scoured the surroundings, searching for any trace of the creature, but it was as if it had vanished into thin air. Frustration mingled with disbelief, our minds struggling to comprehend the events that had unfolded. As we stood there, gazing into each other's eyes, a silent understanding passed between us. We may never fully understand what we witnessed that night, but we knew that our duty remained to protect the innocent, to uphold justice, and to face the darkness head-on, even when it defied explanation. In the end, we may never have a definitive answer to the question that haunted us. Did we truly encounter a monstrous being, or was it an illusion, a trick of the mind? My friend and I, both 18-year-old males at the time, decided to go camping in the Mogollon Rim of northern Arizona. We had no particular spot in mind as to where to camp, so we drove around the NF woods until we came across a small, very secluded lake. I literally brought everything a guy would need to be out camping in the wilderness. Sleeping bags, lighter, food, knife, etc. Except I had forgotten my brand new Coleman tent. I purchased specifically for this adventure. So we wound up just camping in our sleeping bags on the ground next to the fire. It took forever to fall asleep because the temperatures dropped below freezing and we were shaking. We went based off the weather for Payson, Arizona, which was 4,000 feet and 50 miles from where we actually laid camp. My friend, we'll call him Tom, fell asleep before I did. I can't remember if ever did fall asleep or if I was just half asleep. But around midnight, I start hearing some really weird noises in the distance. I knew their elk buggling nearby, so I didn't think much of it. Gradually, a snapping sound kept getting closer and closer to the camp over the course of about a half hour. I started getting scared, hoping it would go away, but it didn't. Suddenly, on the side of camp closest to Tom, I hear something running through the meadow straight toward us. I jumped up so fast and yelled at Tom to get up. While I was yelling at him, I was searching the ground nearby for my .40 caliber handgun. By the time I got the gun and flashlight trained on Tom, there is was massive black bear standing right above him. Tom was trying to get up having realized there was in fact a bear hovering above him. I aimed in the direction of the bear and squeezed the trigger four times. I could hear the bear run off not knowing whether I hit it or not. We were shaking so fiercely afterwards I couldn't tell if it was the cold or the adrenaline. We then packed our sleeping bags and left all of the other stuff to retrieve in the morning and began the half-mile walk back to the dirt road where Tom's car was. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that Bear stalked us all the way back to the car. When I was a kid, I went for cross-country biking nearby to our home. There is a roughly two kilometers, one five miles loop of a forest path in the forest. It is ride able if a bit difficult at some points. After just riding a couple of minutes on a narrow forest path, I see a figure walking ahead of me. It looks like a hooded elderly lady walking really slowly. I cannot see her face or anything, just a dark hood covering her. I recall she being very tall. But I was also just 13 years old, so she could have been normal size. I drove just behind her, but the path is too narrow to overtake her from any of her sides. Also, I get this heavy feeling on my chest telling me not to try to overtake her. I can't explain it, but something just felt very off when I got closer to her. I stop my bike and get off and watch her walk ahead of me. 
I then think that this is silly and she must be startled if she turns around and sees me there. So I think to act cool and turn down to pick up a blueberry. I pick it up, raise my head back to the road ahead of me, and there is nothing. I can see the path ahead maybe 50 meters, and it's just impossible that she would have never done that distance within those five seconds I wasn't watching. I then try to reason this with and think that she must have jumped off-road, since there is extremely thick bushes and I cannot see there. I felt a bit uneasy about this, but decide to continue. I ride my bike about 500 meters more, and there is a cliff where I can see down the road ahead another 500 meters. And there she is, I can see her walking there again really slowly. Again, tall figure covered in a dark hood, I cannot see her face or anything but the hood she is wearing, and she is walking slowly on the road. I really couldn't figure out how she made it there in such a short time, since even I couldn't do the distance in that time even with my bike. I am extremely alarmed at this point, but decide to continue. I drive the hill down and to the spot where I saw her before. Again, there is nothing. At this part of the forest, it is more open and I can see quite far in any direction. Yet she is nowhere to be seen and yet there she was just 30 seconds before. I continue my trip and finally finish my first loop of the trail and decide to go yet another round. After going for a couple of minutes, there she is, exactly the same spot I saw her at the first time, again tall dark hooded, walking slowly. I got totally freaked out after this, I rode off the woods as fast as I could, and in a total panic ride to my friend's home, which was further away from the woods than my own home. Until today I have no idea what I saw, and it gives me the chills when I remember her figure. When I was a little kid, my mom was out of town and I was with my dad at our house. Our house was on a remote Indian reserve in Canada, and about three miles away was my grandparents' house. Our houses were separated by three large wheat fields surrounded by forest. I don't know why, but my dad got me ready at night time, and we started walking on the gravel road to my grandparents' house. My mom had the vehicle with her. I was under the age of five and pretty small girl. I remember it was a clear autumn night. The wheat fields were a few weeks from being harvested, and there was a bright full moon. There wasn't a single vehicle running in miles. We started hearing something following us. It was in the ditch in the tall grass and in the wheat field. My dad held my hand as he grabbed some stones off the gravel road. He started hurling rocks into the ditch. It would run off and then start following us again. He grabbed more stones and put them in his pocket, then put me on his shoulders. I remember holding onto his forehead when I was sitting on his shoulders, and it was all sweaty. I wasn't scared. I was getting excited every time I spotted that thing. I could see a lot better from way up, and I could see the thing's back or shoulders moving through the grass. I'd point it out to my dad, and then he'd throw more stones at it. It kept on coming back. To make matters creepier, we took a shortcut that was along the forest line on a thin dirt road. My dad started whistling loudly for my grandparents' German shepherd boss. The house was still far away, but we could hear boss barking and moving towards us. Whatever that was following us was still following us. That dog was such a welcoming sight to see, sniffed around both of us for a moment then dashed off into the field barking like mad. We got to my grandparents' house, my dad told my grandparents. I fell asleep on the couch. I talked to my dad about it many years later. He said after that they had smudged. My grandparents and father believe in the old ways and think maybe it was some bad medicine spirit and prayed for protection. Whatever it was, I was the target. Predators always go for the youngest or oldest. 
Thanks for listening yet another episode of Nightmare Hours. If you love our stories, do hit that subscribe button. Good night, folks, and see you tomorrow at the same time.